somehow, somehow. <laughs> you know what? When that happens, I'm so happy to have this family to come home to. I'm so happy that we get to be together in his presence and that we feel the warmth of each other's faith lifting. And I'm so glad that some of you are joining us from your house this day, but I got to tell you, you know, come on over to our house and feel the love in the room and let the lift lift you as well. God bless you, everybody. And uh, speaking of being lifted, I'm talking about Pastor Desi. Come on. I don't, last week, come on. I may not have been in this house, but I'm telling you, I was tuned in and God was feeding me, speaking to me through our pastor, Desi. Man, he hit the long ball. And then, obviously, I'm not the only one because many of us, many of you, took the step of faith that he was inviting you to, to connect to a group. You haven't been in one. Now you're connecting to a group. Some are, have been out of service. Some of our leaders have been out of service, and now you're stepping back into service. God bless you for doing that. Some of you who just realized, hey, I need Jesus in my life, and you not just raised your hand, you opened your heart and took the step of faith, and I want to bless and commend every one of you for that, and uh, invite you to do it today as God stirs and speaks to you. And speaking of coming into this house again, we're also happy to welcome back our Lebanon team. The, the final members of that team will be back today. We sent a medical mission team. God bless you, Althea. Happy to see you back in the U.S. of A. And uh, we know that you took the heart of this church family and the love of our Savior into the Middle East. And we just thank God for you and all the team members who made a difference there. We'll be hearing more about that later. Um, and then I just... Uh, I want to welcome God to be at work in your heart, my heart, our presence today. You know what FOMO is? You know, this is not a joke. This is a thing, right? FOMO. You know what FOMO is? Fe you want to say it together? Fear of missing out. It's this, a psychologist say that it is a social anxiety that affects your decision making. Social anxiety that affects your decision making. That something is happening, you're not part of it, and that shades everything that you do. And then it's heightened, that anxiety, by social media, where people are posting about their amazing, fantastic, beautiful lives, and then you're comparing your current experience to that which may seem less than that. Uh, FOMO means that uh, you are obsessing over some people who in your mind seem to have it all, and then that leads you to the fear of not having enough, the fear of missing out, that the way that you're doing life isn't going to lead you to the fulfillment that you long to have in life. The reason I'm telling you that that description fits today's message from Numbers 10 through 14. We are continuing our journey through the wilderness uh, as the people have been brought out of Egypt and now they're making their way through the wilderness. And I tell you, that FOMO mits, uh, fits this message. Why? Because with everything that the people of Israel had going for them, this point in the journey. I mean, they had been brought, they'd been freed from slavery in Egypt. They'd been covered by the blood of the Passover lamb. The Red Sea had parted before them. They watched it collapse in and crush their oppressors. They had been taken to the mountain of God and invited to experience a relationship with God on a new dynamic level. His power and his love was bringing them out and to himself. And then in Numbers chapter 10, through, seven, through 14, we're going to see that something is still going on in them that caused them to miss out on what God had for them. And uh, not just a fear. It wasn't just a fear of what they were missing out by not being in Egypt, though they talk about that. This became the nightmare of missing out on the promised land itself. Now, a real question that it raises for us 
even in 21st century America, is this. Can my being distracted and obsessed with FOMO cost me my best life from God? That, that I will somehow miss the fulfillment of his promise in my life? I mean, it's a heavy question. It's significant. I want to ask it again. Can my being distracted with the fear of missing out cost me my best life from God? Cause me to miss the fullness of his blessing in my life. What do you think? Well, I'll tell you what the Bible says is yes. Yes, that's what this story is trying to tell us. This story is exhibit A type evidence uh, in proving that point. Only the word that the Bible uses isn't FOMO. It uses the word unbelief. Would you like to say that one with me? unbelief. And then the drop downs from what that means, you'll see it other words in the story like stiff-necked, disobedient, contemptuous, testing the Lord. That means putting God's grace and God's patience to the ultimate test. Israel had this tremendous opportunity and then got diverted, misdirected by the postures of willful distraction. Sneaky, but then took them and then rebellion, and it cost them their chance to experience the promised land. This is so sad. I don't know if, you've, if you're familiar with the story, but this is, this is so sad. In fact, it's one of the reasons that I wrote the book, Maturish, uh, to help believers avoid these pitfalls that keep us stuck in less than God's blessing fullness in our lives. This, by the way, the spiritual assessment is now available. We've been working on this for a few years now. It's now available. It's free. You can get it on the Christ Journey app. I hope you'll check it out because my desire is that it will encourage you but also motivate you not to miss the blessing. So, okay, here, let's begin at the end with the tragic climax. Numbers chapter 14, verse 11. The glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of meeting. You know, the holy place, the cloud, the fire. The glory of the Lord appeared to the Israelites. And the Lord said to Moses, how long will these people treat me with contempt? How how long will they refuse to believe in me in spite of all the miraculous signs that I have performed among them? I will strike them down with a plague and destroy them. But, now he's talking to Moses, you know, but I'm gonna make you into a new nation, a nation greater and stronger than they. God's telling Moses, you know, he says, I'm just gonna wipe them all out with a plague and then I'm gonna start over with you and, and see if we can. And you know what Moses says back? Uh, the Egyptians are gonna hear about that. And then they're going to tell that story to everyone that the one who brought them out, guarding them and guiding them, that you brought them out, but you weren't able to finish the job. That you got them out all right, but, but then you, you made an oath to bring them in and you couldn't follow up with your promise. Weren't able to bring them in. And so then he offers this prayer, Moses does. He prays, may the Lord's strength be displayed praying that God will show his strength of character. The Lord is slow to anger, abounding in love, forgiving sin and rebellion, and yet he doesn't leave the guilty unpunished. God is just, but but his character has love and mercy in it. So forgive these people just as you've done since they came out of Egypt from that time until now. And the Lord replied, I have forgiven them as you asked, Nevertheless, as surely as I live and as surely as the glory of the Lord fills the whole earth, not just this little tabernacle, the whole earth. In other words, he's saying, my actions are based on my being, my character. This is who I am. And then he says, and on my being over all creation My actions are not coming from a flash of anger. They're coming as an expression of the fullness of my glory. Not one of the men who saw my glory, the miraculous signs I performed in Egypt and in the desert, but who disobeyed me, but tested me 10 times. Not one will ever see the land I promised on oath 
to their forefathers. It wasn't just their promise. No one who's treated me with contempt will ever see it. Now, did you notice the number there? What was the number? Ten. You, you tested me ten times. We've seen that number in the story before, haven't we? And we've learned that it, it represents completeness. Ten is the number of completeness in the Bible. So ten plagues came on the false gods of Egypt. And through the ten plagues, they were completely exposed. They were completely disposed of. The people turned to their false gods, but they couldn't deliver them. Why? Because they weren't really gods. They were completely exposed as frauds. The Ten Commandments. There's that number again. Ten. What's that about? (laughs) A complete introduction to the essence of God's character. You get to know people, you want to know what their values are. God is giving a complete disclosure of the the values that define him. Ten ten plagues, ten commandments. Now, he says, ten times, ten times you put me to the test in your disobedience and your unbelief. What does that mean? In other words, you know what? You've completely blown it. I've given you this amazing opportunity, and you've completely blown it blown it. Now, before we rush to judge them too quickly, uh, I'm remembering the words of a rabbi when he was asked, you know, why, God, why did you choose the Jews to be your people? And the rabbi said this, you know, it's because Jews are like everybody else, only more so. (laughs) And you got to remember the story. Um, The New Testament says that these stories are in there as types, their patterns, in which we are to look and find ourselves, find our story in their story. So these people are like us. <laughs> that's, that's the message. These people, are, we're like them. These stories are about us. They're about the human condition. This isn't about ethnicity and race. This is about human beings. And the fact is, the New Testament tells us that every person on earth, every human being suffers from the same problem that they have, that they're demonstrating. It's the sin problem. Now, we don't use that word. We don't like that word. It's not a popular idea in our culture. Uh, But at the heart of sin is a self-problem. And I, it's, like I said, it's not a popular idea. We'd rather worship self than, than be aware of self in this regard. But this is where I, we're invited in to see something. Like, for instance, uh, the, the teaching of Scripture is that sin is a reality. It's a simple word, but it, it, it's a big deal. There are sins with an S at the end, and those are like symptoms of the disease. And there is sin with an N at the end, and that's like the source of the symptoms, right? Think of it like this. Like, sin is the factory that churns out the pollution, and then the factory of my sin pours my sins into the water source and starts affecting all of my life, all of my relational life. Everything downstream from myself is affected by my sins. Or another way to think of it is like this. You know, you walk into a room and you see spider webs. What does that tell you? The person did not clean lately. And secondly, there's been a spider in the room. That's how they got there. When you see sins in my life, sins are like the webs that are there because the spider has been at work. And so what the story is trying to invite us into is to say, where do we get all tangled up and why? And here's another way of looking at it. Right in the middle of that little word sin is a great big I. (laughs) At the heart of my sin problem is me. I in the middle with its source. So we've got a sin problem, and this is part of the human condition. There is something in me that shows me when I'm paying attention that I can be my own worst enemy. Now, there are plenty of things in me that also show a divine image 
the divine image of God, you know, so from which we spring this intelligence, personality, gifts, skills, problem solving, decision making, engineering, genius, moral imagination, relational passion. I have the capacity to love and be loved intimately, authentically, to be in deep, strong community with people I love, and all of those reflect the imago Dei, the image of the God who made me and you. But you know what? There's also a fly in the ointment, you know, a, a kink in the hose, a short in the circuit. There is a, a virus in the hard drive that kind of casts this shadow over all of that potential, the source that results in the symptoms of this shadow that hangs over me. I'm intelligent, but you know what? I'm, I, there also seems to be another intelligence vying to be heard inside of me. It's kind of an indivisible and invisible artificial intelligence <laughs> vying to be heard. It's kind of this AI shadow of the soul that wants to, that feels real, but it's not always right. And in that, the story is giving me the opportunity to see, if I'm open, that I don't just need to be saved from my sins, uh, <laughs> from the symptoms. I need to be saved from myself. So we're going to do a deeper dive into that next time we get together into this mystery. But for now, I just want to say that that tendency, it's what's making itself com completely known in Numbers 10 through 14. The Israelites. You know, they're, they're going through the motions, and I'm telling you, they scored a 10. A 10 in this subject. And it cost them. So what does God do after he hears Moses' prayer? Well, he, do, he does forgive them, amazingly, but then he still holds them accountable, responsible as individuals for their choices. So it's justice, but it's tempered with mercy, but they're both very present in the character of God. So God forgives, but he doesn't disown them, and he doesn't condemn them you know, to eternal damnation. But here's what he says. After 10 times, there will not be an 11. I think we're supposed to see that in the story. That this first generation has blown their opportunity to experience the fullness of God's will in the land of promise, and they've shown it in this attitude of unbelief. They're out of Egypt, yep, they're out of Egypt, but you know what? Egypt is not out of them. And they've shown it in their behaviors. So now, chapter 10. Chapter 10, they blow the silver trumpets, you know, and that means everybody pay attention. We're getting ready to move away from the mountain. They've been at the mountain, and now they're supposed to leave the mountain and go on into their journey through the wilderness. And like we discovered the last time we were together, Desi reminded us of this, that they're to travel in community. And in community, they are to be in groups, in tribes, in families, and to be ready for battle. There's warfare that is about to take place. Um, but the next thing you know, <laughs> verse one, now the people complained about their hardships. You know what, they don't pray, they complain. They, and verse 4, they began to crave other food. Again, the Israelites start wailing, if only we had meat to eat. They were greedy for what they didn't have. Skip over to chapter 12, verse 1. It says that Miriam and Aaron, his sister and his brother, Moses' brother and sister, are now talking against Moses. Who does he think he is? I remember pulling him out of the river. They're questioning his authority. Chapter 13, verse 32, the spies were sent into the land to check out the promised land before the people go over, and they come back, and here's what they say. You know, the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there were like giants, huge size, and we seemed like grasshoppers in their eyes and in ours. In other words, we're like bugs. They're just going to squash us, spreading fear and doubt. 
Chapter 14, rebellion breaks out against Moses, against Aaron. So the, and then all the people that night, all the people raise their voices and weep out. They're letting their emotion triumph in their perspective, and they grumble against Moses and Aaron, and they said, you know, if only we had died in Egypt. At least they know how to make mummies over there. We should choose a leader, a real leader, and go back to Egypt. Now, earlier, let's remember, they'd already, they'd griped about the water, the manna, the inconvenience. They rejected God's invitation to meet with him on the mountain. They told Moses, you just go in our place, you know. And, uh, and now they're complaining again about their circumstances, about the food, about the leadership. They're even threatening to stone Moses. Get him out. And somewhere in all of that experience, from God's perspective, they just, they crossed the line. You know, have you noticed this? Some parents count to three before they discipline their children, right? One, <laughs> two, because, you know, this kid's supposed to stop whatever it is that is calling the numbers out before they get to three, because three means implementation of discipline and correction, right? And you know what? God counted to 10, that's what he's saying. God counted to 10, and now he, he holds them accountable, responsible, and is now bringing justice. Chapter 14, verse 28, this is what God says. I'm, I'm going to do to you the very things that I heard you say. In the desert, your bodies will fall. Every one of you, 20 years old or more, who were counted in that census and who has grumbled against me, shown this unbelief, not one of you will enter the land except Caleb and Joshua. They were dreaming, they were believing, they were trusting. But then some of the people say, but what about my kids? He said, well, as for your children, the next generation, I will bring them in to enjoy the land that you have rejected. But your bodies will fall in the desert and your children will suffer from your unfaithfulness for 40 years until the last of you die. In other words, God's going to let natural causes have their way. But none of those who were driven by their FOMO are going to get in the land. Actually, they were possessed by their fear. And that not only has it affected the parents, now the kids are going to be affected by it for the next generation. All the people who were afraid they were going to miss out if they were to really, truly follow God's will in their lives are now, they're going to miss out on the promised land and delay their next generation's arrival. You know what scholars say? This trip could have been made in 11 days, less than two weeks, and now it's going to take them 40 years? Whoa. I mean, what a story. This is like, aren't you glad you weren't there? You know, this is kind of, you read this story and go, glad it's not me. Somebody has to go through it. What a story. What's the main point? Here it is from, some of us are bottom line thinkers. Here's the bottom line. Unbelief makes a mess. By whatever name you call it, we usually don't call it that, but by any name in any form, it makes a mess. Griping, complaining, rebelling, resisting, negativity, fear, all of those make a mess of your life and threaten your opportunity to experience the fullness of God's promises in your wilderness. That that's the, that's the bottom line. And it's like, okay, how does it do that? Well, I itemized a list. This is what I see in the story. And this is what I've experienced in my own life, okay? I'm certainly not immune to unbelief. It cripples your prayers. It robs your joy, it muzzles your testimony, it steals your opportunity, it stifles your influence, it clogs the arteries of your spiritual heart, and it costs you. We're supposed to see that. This is a type, do you see yourself anywhere in it? That's what it's saying. Okay, yeah, yeah, but what about the positive stuff? Okay, let's, do, let's flip the script. If that's what unbelief does, what does faith do? How can you tell when you're demonstrating faith? Okay, here's how. 
It does the opposite. It strengthens your prayers. It multiplies your joys. It amplifies your testimony. It enlarges your opportunity. It increases your influence. And it enlivens your heart. Love that, right? And the New Testament summary, the New Testament, I'd rather have that. The New Testament summary of this, Hebrews chapter 3, verse 19, so we see, talking about us, looking back now, what are we supposed to learn? We see they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. Unbelief makes a mess. Could it be making a mess in somebody's life? Listening today, somebody in this room maybe, somebody sitting next to you, of course it wouldn't be you, but I mean somebody like them. I got to tell you, many times I've found myself praying just like the man who came to Jesus one day. Jesus told him, just believe. He said, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. And I got both things going on here. What am I supposed to do about it? You ever prayed that? That's a good prayer. If that's where you are, you're willing to admit that you got these struggles going on, that's a good prayer. Lord, I believe, but I'm going to have to have some help here. And here's what I have learned in the praying of that prayer, that God doesn't doesn't help my unbelief by taking away the test. He just leaves me in the test because he knows there is no testimony without a test. And so, and but what I've also learned is that God doesn't just give tests to failed people. You know, God gives tests so that what he's been teaching can have opportunity to be applied in the field of conflict, in the wilderness, so that I can succeed and move to the next level. Just keep moving forward. You know, teachers don't give tests to fail students. Well, okay, maybe some do. (laughs) You're thinking of somebody, aren't you? Yeah, maybe some do. No, most teachers on their best day give tests because they have already taught the student toward the test with information that can be proven in the test and so they can succeed and then move to the next level. So likewise with God. But I'll tell you what, if the students in that class have been rebelling or they've been resisting, or they've been distracted, or they've been paying attention to other things, or they really haven't been into it, instead of preparing, even though they knew test day was coming, then I'm telling you what, test day is not going to be a happy day. And it won't be for you either. It won't be a good day. The wilderness is a testing ground. We've talked about this, that God has given his people a boot camp opportunity to apply what they have learned so that they can succeed in the day of testing. The the test circumstances actually put the squeeze on people so that they can see what comes out and then have to take a look at it. You know, it's like when you squeeze a tube of toothpaste. The squeeze doesn't determine what is coming out. The squeeze simply reveals what's already in there. Am I right? You know what? It's the same with us. Same with you. Same with me. Squeezing doesn't determine the character that I'm going to demonstrate, but whatever's on the inside is going to show up on the outside. Why? So then I can take a look at it and say, whoa, where's that coming from? Well, there's that sin thing with I in the middle, and then it shows symptoms like this, so there's, is there another option? And God says, yeah, I'm putting you in the test so that you can apply what you've been learning from me. You already have what it takes, so this test wouldn't have come. But since you're in the test, now just remember what you've learned and apply it on test day. Well, what had they learned? Okay, well, they got delivered. Oh, God is on my side. <laughs> he wants me out and free forward. Let's go back to the Ten Commandments. Let's see. Okay, the first one is put God first. Oh, that, that good on test days. <laughs> put God first. And then there's another one that says, and don't lie. Don't lie to yourself about this either. You know, sometimes we, I kick into this little denial phase, and I start rationalizing stuff. And you know what rationalize is? That's when you tell yourself rational lies. 
<laughs> and, and if I would just, and then he says, don't covet what you don't have. Oh, but I want that food, and I want that, and I want that. No, you just pay attention to the study notes and then apply them now. Remember that God is good that he wants you out and he wants you equipped and he wants you succeeding, that the power and love that has brought you out is power and love enough to take you in, but you have a part in this journey for truth. Trust it. So how are we supposed to do that? How do you build trust? Maybe you've read the book Speed of Trust. This story is telling us if you want to increase the speed of your journey with God, increase your trust in God. And I'm telling you, I'm preaching to the preacher. Say, Bill, are you listening? Because right now I can tell you that a pastor's life is not full of faith and sunshine. That I get darkness and doubt that I fight with, that shakes me up, that shakes me down. You know, some people think, oh, pastors, they get this, you know, uh, free pass from that kind of stuff. They, they, we never have headaches because we take St. Joseph aspirin, you know. I'm telling you, I was not in line the day those gifts were handed out. I get the full-on tests, and I'm telling you that I am, this is like, okay, pay attention, Bill. When doubts are swallowing you, what's the next best step of trust? I'm telling you, and that's for another message. I've already preached it. I'm not going to bring it back to you today. But I do have one illustration that I want to share with you. If today you, (laughs) there is something you can do that will build your trust. And the Bible promises that it will grow your faith, it will open a gateway of miracle response, and at the same time, it will expose and destroy false gods like materialism in your life. And if you, lay, you can lay hold of God's promises for you in ways that will cause you to see them with your own eyes if you take this step. You know what I'm talking about? Okay, fasten your seatbelt. Giving. Uh, what? Okay, wait a minute. Time out. Pause. You know, you're, this is your first time with us, first time online joining us. <laughs> you're a guest of somebody, and now that's the time when you go, uh-huh, preacher's talking about money. I knew it was coming. I knew it was coming. So um, on, the, on the other hand, but I got to tell you, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but this really isn't for you. Um, keep your money. You're a guest you're, you're uh, first time with us. God bless you for being here. You know what I'm talking about. Now, believers, now you're saying, okay, I'm going to talk to the believers a little while. Now you're getting nervous. Where's he going to go with this? And this, this is a blind side. This is a bait and switch. You know, I was okay with you talking about somebody else, but now if he's going to talk about my, as this topic, yeah. Okay, listen. Here's the thing. Um, that's not on my heart. What is on my heart is if you're looking for a way to grow your faith, this is something that nobody else can do in the same way that you can. And I'll tell you this also, if you've been around for a while, then you know that this is not a topic of regular discussion from me on this platform. But I do revisit it every so often. Okay, well, why do you do it now? I'm telling you why. It's a clear biblical way to build your faith. And I don't know that I've ever read a challenge to give in Scripture that doesn't also come with a promise to see God work in the response to it. Like Jesus. Jesus said, give, and it will be given to you. Now, we don't give to get, but he's stating a fact here that you're kicking in to some level of experience where God is paying attention, and you give, and it will be given to you. Look at this. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your lap. You're going to see something happen, and with the measure that you use, it will be measured to you. And I'm telling you, I don't think Jesus was after money. I think he was seeking to help people believe, asking for faith to apply what they'd been learning from him about God. And then he said this, that something happens on the inside when we do this on the outside. He said, wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart is. So if you want your heart to be full on with God, then just start trusting him with the things you treasure. 
and then watch what happens to your heart. Now, it's been a while since I've, gave, I've given this challenge, but I've made it before through the years. And so I want to say this. If you are not trusting God with your money, brother, sister, fellow believer, start. Start. Start somewhere. Start somewhere. Every paycheck, give something. A tithe is a biblical standard. It means a, a, a dime of every dollar, 10%. Oh, wait, there's that number again. 10. God's got a thing about this number, doesn't he? 10. What is, what's happening here? What if God is inviting us, inviting you, into a complete step of faith? Which I can tell you, a dime's not going to break you. 10%'s not going to break you. I can also tell you this from experience. It will get your attention upward. You start paying attention when you give. And by the way, I'll also disclose to you that Lisa and I, this has been our practice of giving for our entire married life. This is where we start. This is our standard, and then we build on that for missions and other community organizations, et cetera. But this has been our standard, 10% of gross income. Okay, wait, if that makes you choke or freaks you out, then and you can't imagine ever doing that, then this is what I want to suggest to you. If you want to build your faith, start at 1%. Start a penny of every dollar to God. Start at 1% and then grow it by another penny, another percent for the next five pay periods. I know this is really practical, isn't it? The next five periods, pay periods. And then each time, tell the Lord, Lord, I'm trusting you with this. This is part of my treasure, and I want to put my heart in your hand, and I, I'm asking you to fulfill your promise in my life. And then grow that by 1% over the next five pay periods, which probably will amount to something like 10 weeks. Am I close? And uh, each time you tell the Lord, and then at the end of those 10 weeks, here's what you need to do. You check and see if you're not sleeping under a bridge and you're not eating dog food from a can, then keep trusting God and keep watching him. And somewhere in there, God is going to show up and it's going to amaze you. It will be your own story. It's not going to be me talking. Your story of God responding to your faith, but then something else is also going to be happening. Here's what it is. You're, you're going to be building trust. You're going to be exercising faith. And when we do that, Scripture says God rewards faith. It's impossible to please God without faith. This is the opposite of unbelief. But without faith, it's impossible, but he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Hebrews eleven six. 6. Unbelief makes a mess, but believing brings reward. Now, one final, one final point. This story is not about losing your salvation. We'll talk more about this in the future, but the promised land is not a metaphor for heaven after you die. It's a metaphor for the fullness of God's blessing coming to you on this side. We'll talk about that more, not, not right now. But Christ followers don't lose their salvation. But we can miss out on the fullness of living in his promise. Don't be that guy. Don't be that girl. God didn't disown his people because they didn't respond with perfect obedience. He forgave them before Moses asked him to, but it was still their unbelief that kept them from experiencing his promises. Don't let it do that to you. 1 Corinthians 9, Paul shares with us his FOMO. Did you know super spiritual giant apostle Paul had a FOMO? He tells us about it, he says, after preaching to others, you know, I'm, I discipline myself so that after preaching to others, I will not be disqualified for the prize. He's not talking about his salvation. His salvation is secure. You know what his FOMO was? He's afraid he's going to miss out on the experience of God's reward 
in the blessing of his life and ministry. I want to be like that. I got fears in my life, but that's the biggest fear. And it's the fear of the Lord that's the beginning of wisdom. May God lead us all into another step of wisdom today as we pray now. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your patience, for your kindness, and yet for your truth, that you are full of grace and truth, that you slice through the fog and you expose the false gods and you call us into real faith where you will really show up with blessing, with opportunity. Sister, brother, what is it that God is saying to you today? Can I invite you to lean into that? What's your next step of faith today? Where have you been at risk of unbelief in complaining and grumbling and going your own way and wanting another leader and who knows what? But the Holy Spirit knows and he can tell you, now give that to God, turn full-hearted to him and take this step of faith. What is your step of faith today? To trust him with that wayward child, to trust him with the relational challenge, to trust him with your health, to trust him with your money? Yeah, he doesn't want to leave any part of our lives out of his blessing. What is your step today? And for somebody, this may be your step, your first step of faith to say, Jesus, come into my life. There's a spider in me. Oh, is that what it is? Something in me that needs your treatment. And so I receive your death on the cross as my forgiveness of sin. And I receive your life in my life as more powerful than the power of sin in me. Lead me now. Come into my life, forgive my sin, and lead me as I seek to follow you by faith. Now, if you prayed that prayer with me, our heads are still bowed for a moment, but if you would let me ask God's blessing upon your next step of faith, would you simply raise your hand wherever you are, to my right in the back, right here toward the front. Amen, 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 amen. God bless you. To my left here in the middle, to the center toward the aisle. Amen. What is God saying is your next step of faith? On my left, God bless you. God bless you. Lord Jesus, I pray for each person who by lifting their hand is saying, my heart is open. And I pray that you would respond to their prayer now by giving them the peace that passes human understanding, the joy that bubbles up when your freedom comes alive. In your name I pray, amen.